My name is Jacqueline Wilcox. I'm the chair of the Sydney Institute. Um, so I'm very, um, I'm delighted to welcome you all here to our 2024 uh, season. And it is sort of apt, I think, that uh, our first season is being launched, is, is the launch of Jared Henderson's uh, updated edition of this fantastic book, Cardinal Pell, The Media Pylon and Collective Guilt. Um, I'll speak more about the launch in a minute, but I think it's also right that I... Sorry, I'm too short as well. Um, it's only right that I thank our good friends here at King & Wood Mallisons in advance for the use of this rather splendid room. And, uh, and I know that they would want me to um, observe the courtesy of acknowledging that we are meeting today on Aboriginal land and to pay our respects to Elders, um, as, is, as I said, is only um, a courteous thing to do. And of course, we do do that. Um, so as I said, we're beginning the, the year of the tooth of uh, 2024 uh, with the launch of Jared's book by um, our eminent uh, academic um, social justice campaigner and um, Jesuit priest, um, Father Frank Brennan S.J. So we're quite delighted that he is here, not only because he himself has written this rather splendid book, um, observations on the Pell proceedings, which, like Jared's book, will be available here tonight. Um, Father Brennan has written on uh, this rather intriguing case uh, extensively, and I, I do actually recommend um, his his uh, writings to you if you haven't already come across them. Uh, Jared's. Um, I'm going to be brief because we've got a lot to get through tonight, but I just want to say that Jared's. A scholarly um, and extensive book has been very well received. As you know, it was first published in 2021 by Margaret Canine. Sorry, a launch by Margaret Canine SC, who you know, as you as you would all remember, um, was a very experienced and well regarded prosecutor of child sex abuse cases. Uh, and of now, she is, of course, um, as well as a great friend of the Sydney Institute. She is also now a very well regarded and successful defence barrister. But also it's been well received um, across the judiciary and we're really honoured that um, His Honour, former High Court Judge Michael Kirby is with us tonight. Um, you will recall that on the back of the book and even the flyers that we sent out, um, His Honour made uh, some great observations including he said that Jared's book was an important contribution to the efforts to establish a criminal cases review commission as in the United Kingdom, New Zealand and Canada. Um, His Honour said, effective prote protections against miscarriages of justice in Australia must be there for all serious cases, even for a cardinal, which is a great segue, I think, into um, inviting Father Brennan to come and, um, and launch Jared's book and also to offer him our great thanks for doing so. Father Brennan. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. And thank you for those words of introduction, Jacqueline. And it's great to be here with Jared on the occasion of the launch of the new edition of his book. And as ever, grateful to Anne for all of the organisation. I thought and hoped that I'd said my last public word on George Cardinal Pell a year ago after his funeral. I was convinced to write the obituary for the London tablet because the editor thought that given the history of dealings between the late Cardinal and me, I could walk the fine line between demonization and canonization. I contributed to the commemorative issue of the Catholic Weekly. I gave one interview outside St. Mary's Cathedral as the security people were clearing away the temporary fencing which separated the protesters from the worshippers. I then delivered one address about the trials and appeals of the Cardinal. In part with that address, I was wanting to publish my letter to Pell between the first and second trials when I first succeeded but ultimately failed in trying to convince him to give evidence at his second trial. He had written in his prison journal, Frank Brennan was always keen for me to be in the box, especially after the hung jury decision. Eventually I decided I should give evidence, despite the entire legal team and my own advisers being opposed. Terry Tobin came around to my point of view. I only decided not to take the stand after the prosecutor had dealt with Charlie Portelli and especially Max Potter. 
I was so cross with the treatment they both received. I was frightened that my hostility might turn to a majority for acquittal in a split decision. The basis of my reasoning was quite wrong. As far as I was concerned, I did not think I could say anything further that might be useful, wanting to avoid any ongoing hurt to victims of child sexual abuse and bona fide complainants. But now, the relentless scribe of Australian media shortcomings and the failings of the Victorian criminal justice system, Gerard Henderson, has published a new edition of his Cardinal Pell, The Media Pylon and Collective Guilt. Gerard has graciously asked me to launch the new edition because he will then have the last word here at the Sydney Institute. I'm pleased to honour Gerard by accepting the invitation and I'm pleased to add my own remarks in relation to the larger-than-life George Pell a year since his death. Even George Pell's great admirer and disciple, Bishop Peter Elliott, who was at Oxford with him, admits that George was more an historian than a theologian. I visited Oxford some years ago and took the opportunity to read George's 1971 D. Phil thesis entitled The Exercise of Authority in Early Christianity from about 170 to about 270. It's all there. Which ecclesiastical leader comes to mind in our era when you hear these words from the thesis? And let me give you a few paragraphs from the thesis. This study examines the changing patterns of authority both within and between the local Christian communities at the end of the second century and during the third. Amid the general tightening of church discipline, the most significant development is the expansion and consolidation of a monarchical episcopate rather than a monopiscopate. A monarchical bishop is distinguished from one of the latter type by a greater control over the local congregation, a universal acceptance within his community of his position as chief teacher, having the last word on questions of orthodoxy and the ability to act without the approval of his clergy and laity. He went on to say, as orthodox and heretical teachers began to develop a Christian theology during the second century, the teaching role of the clergy was brought under severe pressure. The bishops led the fight for orthodoxy, characterised their opponents as intellectuals, and channelled popular feeling for their position by appealing to the simple, traditional oneness of faith against the speculations and extravagances of their opponents. In his concluding chapter, he wrote, Christianity was not primarily a theology, but a saving faith and a church in which unity and uniformity were necessary. Organisation and authority were to cut through the debilitating pluralism in Rome and outside the city if necessary. Whether this approach was desirable and justified in terms of the church's community he said, uh, and the required fidelity to the teachings of Christ is not a question to be answered here. In the added chapter 12 of Jared's new edition, Pell's antipathy to the recent plenary council in Australia and the ongoing synod on synodality in Rome is detailed, including Pell's assertion that our Australian plenary council was largely irrelevant to the preaching of the gospel. Then there is the posthumously published article written for The Spectator describing Pope Francis's cherished synod on synodality as a toxic nightmare with the preliminary document for the synod being described as one of the most incoherent documents ever sent out of Rome. When I dined in Rome with Pell a month before his death, he was confidently predicting the death of Pope Francis and thus the immediacy of a pending conclave. Though he was too old to attend the conclave, his Roman network was second to none and he was engaged in a series of discussions with like-minded senior clerics who were worried about the diverse range of new cardinals appointed from some of the less notable sees in the world and who did not know each other due to the travel restrictions imposed by COVID. There was a document doing the rounds entitled The Vatican Today and authored by Demos, 
the people. The document was very critical of Pope Francis and his writings, asserting papal writings demonstrate a decline from the standard of St John Paul II and Pope Benedict. Even worse, decisions and policies are often politically correct. Gerard typically and rightly acknowledges that there's a variety of viewpoints about how involved Pell was in the formulation of this document. There would be no one better positioned than George Weigel to know how Pell was involved in this exercise. Weigel writes, and Gerard quotes him, judging from both the text and my conversations with the Cardinal, it seems to me likely that the document was the result of conversations among more than a few members of the College of Cardinals. Certain formulations, however, are quite familiar to those who were in regular contact with Cardinal Pell. And he seems to have been, on Magister's testimony, the final redactor of what came out of those conversations. Pell's 1971 thesis holds the key to understanding how such a loyal churchman could, in his dying days, be expressing such strong criticisms of head office and even of the pontiff himself. Here in Australia and outside church circles, Pell is still primarily admired or loathed as the focus of the national media and the Victorian criminal justice system. It's very heartening to see that retired High Court Justice Michael Kirby, who's with us this evening, has endorsed Jared's book as, quote, a very good read, observing, quote, even if one did not study more than the time interval taken to cross the cathedral, a very serious doubt was raised as to Cardinal Pell's guilt. Effective protections against miscarriages of justice in Australia must be there for all serious cases, even for a cardinal, writes Kirby. You've er all heard more than enough of my views about the abuses of the Victorian criminal justice system in the case. As I've previously said, it was nothing more than an appalling police sting operation protracted by grossly erroneous judicial reasoning by Victoria's two most senior judges. Following Kirby's lead, let's look only at the time interval to cross the cathedral. As Jared says, put simply, Pell could not have been at the scene of the crimes, and nor could the alleged victims. Any of you knowing anything about the case would know that the prosecution and the two erring senior Victorian judges could postulate neither evidence nor even a theory about how Pell and the two boys could be alone together in the priest's sacristy immediately after the solemn 11am Mass. How must the Victorian Chief Justice and the President of the Court of Appeal have felt when they read these words in the unanimous judgment of the seven High Court judges? Quote, The principal difficulty with the Court of Appeal majority's analysis is that it elides Potter's estimate of five to six minutes of private prayer time with the estimate of five to six minutes during which the two boys re-entered the cathedral, made their way into the priest's sacristy and were assaulted. And with the understatement of the century from the High Court, the two periods are distinct. There was no time or place for Pell and the two boys to be alone together for the five to six minutes needed for the described offending to occur. The first period of private prayer time occurred commencing once the procession moved off from the foot of the sanctuary. No one has ever managed to posit even a theory as to when the second period, the time of offending, could have occurred. Thus the need for the Court of Appeal majority to elide the two periods into one, presuming that the offending in the sacristy occurred at the very same time that everyone was processing from the foot of the sanctuary down the main aisle and around the exterior of the cathedral. It was as if the cathedral were inhabited not by human beings, but by angels able to bilocate. In his masterful dissent in the Victorian Court of Appeal, Justice Mark Weinberg observed in the present case 
there was a significant body of cogent evidence casting serious doubt upon the complainant's account, both as to credibility and reliability. With no time or place for possible offending, we move into the realm of fantasy, conjecture and invention. We move well beyond the realm of proof beyond reasonable doubt. You will recall that the second incident described by the complainant was truly preposterous. Weinberg, the most experienced criminal court judge in the country, said, the complainant's account of the second incident seems to me to take brazenness to new heights, the like of which I have not seen. After the Court of Appeal decision and prior to the application for special leave to appeal to the High Court, David Marr phoned me to discuss religious freedom because I was sitting on the expert panel chaired by Philip Ruddick and set up by Malcolm Turnbull. At the end of our conversation, he asked me how I thought the Pell case would go. I answered with words to this effect. David, you know enough about the law to know that only a fool would assure you that the High Court will grant special leave in a criminal case. But I think George will get special leave, and if he does, I think he'll get off and win 7-zip. David was absolutely incredulous. How can you say that? I answered, because, David, there is no one on the High Court who would write the sort of nonsense written by those two in the Victorian majority. So there will be no one with whom others could agree to such preposterous reasoning. I think I was right. David still owes me a dinner. The now Chief Justice of the High Court, Stephen Gagler, was not very interventionist during the oral argument of the High Court of Appeal, but it all got too much for him when the Victorian DPP, Kerry Judd, made yet another attempt to free herself from the prosecution's claim that Pell and the boys had to be alone together in the sacristy for five to six minutes. This was the damning exchange. Judd, I do not want to tie myself to the five to six minutes. We say, yes, that is open, but also what I want to make very clear it is also that when it starts, so you might have your five to six minutes, but there might be the clearing out of the cathedral before that five or six minutes. Gagler, when you say clearing out, are you referring to Potter's evidence or are you referring to something else? Judd, yes, and I was going to take you to it and I think it's probably easier that they do take you. Gagler, he's referring to the procession clearing out. Judd, yes, the procession, I beg your pardon. Gagler, does he mean the congregation? Are you drawing a distinction? Judd, okay, no. If there had not been suppression orders in place during the original trials, no doubt attentive journalists and members of the public could have attended to the impossibility of the prosecution's claim. In his new edition, Jared points out that the original 11 chapters of his book are uncorrected, except for the correction of some misspellings and a few minor changes. He writes, no one has advised me of any significant errors of fact or sought changes to the text. That includes those who led the media pylon, which Jared has extensively documented. And media pylons, as you know, is a subject dear to Jared's heart. So to that I now turn. It's useful to highlight the groupthink that infected especially the authors, Lucy Morris Marr and Melissa Davey, who wrote books on the case, leading them into serious errors. After I published my first opinion piece on the Pell trials on the day when the suppression orders were lifted, Melissa Davey, author of The Case of George Pell, posted a series of tweets. They've since been deleted, of course, but let me quote some of them to you. Let's talk about Frank Brennan, shall we? The Jesuit priest, who in a column has slammed the journalists who spent three months of their lives in the Pell trials. Brennan was barely in the trial. He did not sit through most of the evidence. She concluded, quote, it's offensive that he would criticise those who covered the trial in full. I hope the reporters there with me won't mind me sharing that we check notes and facts with each other constantly to get it 100% right. There were no divisions between the news organisations. His divisive, inaccurate commentary is harmful 
And while he has a right to his opinion, he has no right to assume the thoughts and attitudes of those who put in the hard yards. None. As for his comments about journos lacking law experience, some of my colleagues in the trial have covered courts for years. Their knowledge is incredible. We all have high-level legal contacts to ensure we get it right. As far as I'm concerned, Brennan's credibility on this issue is absolutely shot. He has a right to free speech and opinion, but he's written stuff about the case that is no more than rumour and has shown utter disrespect for the legal process. End. Morris Maher, the author of Fallen, uh, then weighed in. So this gets even more ridiculous and amusing. The Australian, who didn't send any staff to the retrial, have given a platform for Pell's support of Brennan to slam the experienced senior reporters who are there every single day. Brennan wasn't even there every day. Enough. Now, I had no criticism of Shannon Deary from the Herald Sun, John Ferguson from the Australian, or others such as Emma Younger from ABC News, Hilary Whiteman from CNN, Damien Kaye from the New York Times. My criticisms had been specifically of the ABC's Louise Milligan, Davy, and Morris Maher. I had many discussions with Shannon Deary and John Ferguson. I even escorted one of them through the cathedral, demonstrating how fantastic was the claim that Pell and the two boys could have been alone together for five to six minutes while concelebrants, altar servers, sacristans and money counters came and went. On the 28th of September 2020, the US-based National Catholic Reporter reported that Melissa Davey had sharply rebutted commentators like me who had claimed that the complainant in the case presented confused testimony. David was quoted as saying, quote, in the conversations that occurred between journalists and lawyers in the corridors of the courthouse, I never heard anyone who'd been present during the complainant's testimony say that he had performed badly. Instead, the complainant was described as compelling and honest. I responded with a letter to the editor. Let me quote part of it. You report that Melissa Davey sharply rebutted me for what I said about the Pell trial. Davey wrongly asserted that I did not have access to the trial transcript when I wrote my one article when the suppression order was lifted in February 2019. She fancifully claims inside knowledge from lawyers who heard the complainant give his evidence. I went on to say, last week at the launch of her book, when asked, what did you come to think in the end of Pell's accuser? She said, it didn't matter who I spoke to, who was there, because obviously I had conversations with the legal teams, plural, in the hallways of the court between different hearings and things like that. They all described him, the complainant, as eloquent, articulate and honest. In my letter I said, it would be a breach of the law for any lawyer who was present for the testimony of the complainant to background a journalist on the performance of the complainant. There is no way a lawyer for the defence would have said any such thing. It would be completely unethical as well as illegal for any lawyer for the prosecution to do so. I'm so confident of the ethics of the lawyers involved in the case on both sides as to assert that none of them told Davy that the complainant was eloquent, articulate and honest. She went on to say, Davy quotes from my article of February 2019 in which I spoke about the complainant being confused about all manner of things. In that article, I told the reader, I heard some of the publicly available evidence and have read most of the transcript. I joined issue with Davy in my letter, observing, in her sharp rebuke of me, Davy wrote that she found it incredible that commentary such as this was being published and broadcast long before transcript could have been accessed at the court. She was correct when she stated it would take days to thoroughly review transcripts for a case that ran for five weeks. Pell's trial had concluded on the 11th of December 2018. I, unlike her, had access to the transcript for more than two months before writing my article. Davy could not access the transcript for some time after that, but that was her problem, not mine. I had many weeks to thoroughly review the transcripts. Having provided my materials to Davy and Morris Maher, I, like Jared, have never received a word of correction or, dare I say, apology. 
I agree with Jared's assessment. The avoidance of public debate and discussion about one of the most important criminal law cases in Australian history, especially on the ABC and in nine newspapers and The Guardian Australia, was mere intellectual cowardice. I commend Jared's new edition and I endorse the praise expressed by experienced lawyers like Michael Kirby with us this evening, Doug Drummond and Margaret Kinnean. Let me conclude with the same words with which I concluded the interview outside St Mary's Cathedral at the solemn pontifical mass of Christian burial of His Eminence George Cardinal Pell AC, 8th Archbishop of Sydney. I think the great lesson to take home has been the scriptural lesson of the funeral today, which is about forgiveness, being able to endure suffering, being able to endure the obloquy of people out there in the mainstream media and all of that. But be able to stand up for what you regard as truth, what you regard as reconciliation, and what you regard as justice. And I think that was a good take home message, hopefully even for those who are protesting. And we won't see the like of Cardinal Pell again for a very long time. May George rest in peace. Thank you, Father Brennan. Um, we are going to have some questions after, so I'm, I'm looking forward to being able to talk to Father Brennan about the relationship that he had with Cardinal Pearl, which for me is sort of a great subtext of this incredible saga. But it now brings me to um, uh, invite Jerry to say a few words. As I've mentioned, Jared's book has been aptly described as scholarly and exhaustive. And I think they're the two fabulous words to actually describe Jared. Um, he doesn't really need any introduction as our executive director and, uh, the, and the writer of this great work. So, Jared, please come and say a few words. Uh, thanks to Jacqueline and, uh, and to Nick, our former chairman who's here tonight, and Jacqueline, our current chair, uh, for the introduction and for all you do for us. Um, I, um, I'm not going to speak for a great length of time. Uh, I'll be brief. Uh, there are other people to hear from, but I just want to say a few things. So thanks to Frank Brennan for another great performance tonight. But uh, he's not only a brilliant lawyer and a great communicator, but he has a heck of a lot of courage because to do what Frank did um, in those times was, was not easy. And thanks also to uh, Katrina Lee, who, gave, like Frank, gave me a lot of information when doing the early parts of this book. Um, and she couldn't be here tonight. She's interstate. And Henderson, of course as usual, advising on the text and, and doing research for me. The legend Matthias, who typed it and it typed the manuscript, advised on the text. Paige Helley, who advised on the text but did the cover and the photographs of Nomi Killen, who helped a lot with the research in the latter period. John Howard, who launched uh, the book on the first occasion. And I should get this right. The Honourable Michael Kirby, ACCMG. Is that right? <laughs> Last time I missed the CMG. Oh, my God. Um, yeah, it's St Michael and St George, and it's okay because St George was a Catholic, wasn't he? Because it's before the Reformation. Uh, I'm not sure who St Michael was. I don't know. If anyone knows, let me know. Now, Michael Kirby and I have got, I think, is an odd, odd kind of relationship. We sort of disagree on everything, but we get on quite well. And uh, in a recent uh, ex uh, email exchange uh, um, on another matter. Um, the Honourable Michael Kirby, ACCMG, said, Martin Luther, who started the Protestant Reformation, of course, was right on so many issues, including mar marriage, although not for gays, he went straight to hall. I think he meant hell. <laughs> but it was typing error, and I made those myself. So um, he went straight to hell. Luther said that. He was also an anti-Semite, Luther, and he added, no one's perfect. And it took me some time, but after some thought, I thought I'd better reply to this, this go at me about Luther and all that. So I said, as to the Protestant Reformation and all that, in my advanced years, I appreciate Thomas Cramner, but not Luther. Now, as you know, Thomas Cramner was the first Protestant Archbishop of Canterbury after the Protestants took over Canterbury Cathedral. It's only 500 years ago, but some of us still can't get over it, you know. I mean, it's only, not that long, for God's sake. Uh, whereupon the good Protestant Michael replied to the not-so-good Catholic Jared. He said, 
You only prefer Cramner because he was burnt at the stake. <laughs> That's another God, Mary, Queen Mary. There you go. Now, um, many thanks to Frank for launching this and to Michael Kirby for his endorsement, which has caused a lot of interest and for good reason. Um, I just want to make a few points tonight. After Cardinal's death just over a year ago, the critics, his critics in the media pile on and elsewhere turned to the Royal Commission uh, into institutional um, responses to child sexual assault, uh, abuse, um, because they couldn't really argue against the High Court 7-zip decision for the reasons Frank po points out in his excellent book and his attitude today. So they went to the Royal Commission because that had made hostile findings against George Pell. And... Um, but what they didn't look at, and they're just in this book, the Royal Commission is full of, in relation to the findings on Cardinal Pell, and I've pointed them out and I've drawn them to the attention of the, uh, the Royal Commissioner, uh, Peter McClellan, now KC. Um, it was full of inconsistencies in relation to George Pell and errors, and they continued after George Pell's death. Now, Peter McClellan um, launched, uh, wrote a foreword to a book by... Um, Chrissy Foster, which was co-authored or helped by Paul Kennedy of the ABC, who was one of the members of the pylon. Now, in this forward to the book, which I put at the part of the new chapter, Peter McClellan writes, and this was repeated by Michael Rowland on ABC TV, <clears throat> Cardinal George Pell gave evidence to the Royal Commission to the effect that the Catholic Church did not understand that the rape of a child was a crime, seeing it as a moral failing. And... Um, Michael Rowland repeated that. Now, I document him a book, and I've got the documents over there. What happened was that George Pell not only gave written evidence where he said pedophilia, clerical pedophilia was a crime, he not only wrote it in, the, in his official statement to the Royal Commission, he actually said it in oral hearings when Peter McClellan was pr presiding as chair of the Royal Commission. I think to verbal the dead like that is very unprofessional. Now... Um, and I have the documents, and it's in the new it's in the new chapter. Now Louise Milligan wrote in the Saturday paper, and she was one of the many to join in um, the pile on after Pell's death in relation to what the Royal Commission had found, despite its flaws. They included Lucy Morris Marr, Darren Hinch, Paul Kennedy, Ray Hadley, um, Barney Schwartz, David Marr, Susan Smith, Magda Szymanski, Mike Carlton, and and others. Um, but Louise Milligan again went to the Royal Commission and she also went to one other case where she said that um, Pell had not been tried and should have been. And Professor Jeremy Gans, a well-known lawyer of Melbourne University and comments on these matters, highly respected lawyer in the area of criminal law and other areas of law, he, he, he tweeted this. It's a recurrent problem with Milligan's journalism. If there are facts that don't help her argument... She doesn't tell her readers. She just leaves them out. Now, that's a very serious criticism um, of the ABC's main reporter on the Pell case over five years, that if she doesn't like the facts, she just leaves the facts out. Um, Matt Collins, uh, KC in Melbourne, um, gave a comment to the ABC TV Media Watch program, which is presented, as you know, by Paul Barry, about royal commissions. It was about a matter of defamation, but it doesn't really matter. It's the same point. And a lot, a lot of journalists, including Louise Milligan, do not understand this. He, Matt Collins said, Royal commissions make factual findings in a particular context involving the exercise of executive as opposed to judicial power. However, at a, however distinguished a royal commission may be, experience has shown that clear or conclusive findings that one makes are often not vindicated in subsequent judicial proceedings, whether criminal or civil. And in fact, the Royal Commission had no facts against Pell, no evidence, forensic or witness evidence. They used words like, if you, it's an untenable that it didn't happen, it's inconceivable that this doesn't happen. But those words are used when you don't have facts. I mean, what, what was tenable if something's untenable? What was conceivable if something's in, uncon, inconceivable? Um, and I've gone through the, uh, the report of the Royal Commission. Um, and I think the essential 
the essential problem with the Royal Commission, in my view, was a massive fail. Peter McClellan KC and the Royal Commission e examined no government schools. Um, he looked only at, although he says he has in an article in the Australian, and he certainly did look at three New South Wales government schools in three pages of one report, out of three pages out of about 200 pages, but only with reference to the sexual abuse of students by other students. That was all. Now, since the Royal Commission reported at the end of 2017, there have been two reports in the child sexual abuse in Tasmanian government schools, which have led to very serious findings. Um, there is currently a massive problem in Victoria, starting on Bo Morris Primary School with three teachers, extending to 23 other schools where those three teachers taught. So that's 23 schools with respect to three teachers. Some former teachers have come to me and one former teacher came to me, it's in the book, and said he went to the Royal Commission to speak about what happened in his school in rural Victoria. He, he was interviewed by the Royal Commission. He got a, a pro forma thank you from Peter McClelland and they never looked at it. They never looked at that school. And there's, uh, at the moment, there's this, um, uh, the Kathleen Foley SC inquiry in Victoria looking into these 23 schools that's due to report. Now, Dan, Daniel Andrews promised to early last year to apologise to what he described as victim survivors of child sexual abuse in government schools in Victoria, but he resigned before he did so. Before doing so, the current uh, Premier, Jacinta Allen, I understand, is going to make an apology in 2024, but this issue has barely been, uh, the surface has barely been scratched on this issue. Now, in fairness, um, Ted Ballew, when he was the Coalition Prime, uh, Premier of Victoria, he set up an inquiry which was specifically into child sexual abuse in institutions other than government institutions. So it's little wonder that um, nobody looked at government schools and many government institutions simply weren't examined. And the Royal Commission focused predominantly on the Catholic schools, but also the Anglican schools and some other Christian schools that didn't look, at, didn't look seriously or didn't look at one government school in the whole of Australia. And there's also an inquiry now in New South Wales and the Northern Beaches following the Chris Dawson case, which you'll know about. Now, I'm just going to conclude there and uh, just say one thing. My final conversation with uh, George Pell, I mentioned in the, at the end of the book, uh, we addressed a small conference um, of priests up in, in, in uh, north, uh, northern, northwest Sydney. And um, I got a question and I was asked, uh, what, what did I think about the whole case? And I said, well, uh, I thought, Pell was in the audience and I thought, well, if I was asked a question, I usually give an answer. So I said, well, look, I wouldn't have wanted to have done 405 days in what was essentially solitary confinement. But I said, I think it was the best that it happened that way because if he hadn't got a full clearance, seven zip in the high court, he would have had no chance of getting rid of these allegations. You, you needed a very definitive finding on it and that's what he got with everything else withdrawn either by the police or by the prosecution. Um, and so it happened, I was seated next to him at lunch just after I'd spoken. He spoke first, I spoke second. Uh, Monica DeMitt smoke, smoke, uh, spoke after lunch and, um, and I said to him, I, I didn't know how he was going to react, so I said to him, oh, George, I hope you weren't upset by what I said, but I was asked a question by a priest in the audience and I gave an answer and um, that was that. And he said, oh, no, Jared, he said, I've been thinking exactly that thing, that sort of thing myself in recent times. He said, yeah, I understand that. And then he, said, he added, he said, and if I hadn't spent over a year in jail, I never would have written my prison journal, of which he was very proud. And that's really the last conversation I had with, with him. But um, I think the prison journal is a, is a remarkable work, um, although many people will disagree with it, but it's a very remarkable work. And uh, he was glad he did it, and I'm glad he did it. And I'm... Um, particularly grateful for all the work that Frank did on this over the years. Thank you. But I want to um, take the first question, if I may, and just I was having a chat with Father Brennan beforehand because I think I alluded that I thought one of the great stories to come out of this terrible saga was the relationship between um, Father Brennan and Cardinal Pell. And as many of you would know, it hasn't always been as... Um, rosy as it, it as it ended and it, it's almost biblical in in its theme of 
uh, standing by one's fellow, uh, speaking up for justice, ignoring um, past disagreements. So if I may, Father Brennan, could you, uh, could you sort of write and, um, enlighten us more about the relationship and how it came to pass? You know, our, and we referred to the quote that Cardinal Pearl said about you, that uh, you are acceptable to the literati and the glitterati. So um, I hope that you uh, expand on that for the literati and glitterati who are here tonight. Thank you. <laughs> uh, yes, Cardinal Pell and I, we had acute differences over the years, as many of you would be aware. And when all of this was getting underway and I could see the train wreck that was emerging in Victoria, I wrote to him and I basically said, look, I know you think I'm a piece of work, but I'm going to give you some gratuitous advice. I said, I think you need to get someone like a retired county court judge who can sit in on these proceedings while suppression orders are in place. Then when it's all over, then at least the Catholic community can be reliably informed what's gone on behind closed doors. So I'd written to him. A few weeks later, it was organised that we would have lunch. And so we had lunch, I think at Bambini Trust, is it? Very fine lunch. He said, um, well, I've spoken to my people and uh, they think it would be better to have you because you'll go over better with the literati and the glitterati. <laughs> so basically a way was worked out in which I could perform the task. Yes, we always had our differences. Uh, but during the course of the two trials, I got to know him. And I think probably a good way to describe it was in 2021, I wrote a long article for the Irish Journal Studies about the case and the position of the Australian church in the wake of what had gone on with Pell. And I sent it to him. And he emailed me back on St. Patrick's Day, 2021. Dear Frank, Thanks for the kind note and the splendid article. Despite your admitting to a small number of neo-Protestant views, <laughs> with alas the potential for others, on my issue you've been consistently just, insightful and courageous. I owe you a lot, but the long-term health of Australian public life has also been strengthened by your writings. Please God, with the further passing of the years, you will lapse closer to full orthodoxy. <laughs> and continue to deploy your considerable skills even more effectively for the Holy Mother Church, the Society of Jesus Serves. We all have our secret ambitions. Thanks again for all your hard work and congratulations on the just and insight of your judgments in the Lord CGP. Well, I think that just about sums him up and sums up the relationship we have. So do we... Do we have any further questions? Um, I'm, I'm actually happy to do a follow-up because I wanted to talk to, to Jared about expanding on what Father Brennan had called, you know, the, the Victorian police sting on um, Cardinal Pell, but perhaps also on the Catholic Church and how you, I think even Cardinal Pell referred to this too, that, that uh, what was happening to him was in some way a result of the failings of the Catholic Church in some of those allegations I know, Father Brennan, you have said that. Jared, can you expand on that? Um, yeah. And Tony Abbott mentioned it too, didn't he? In yeah. um, well, before I do, I should say, uh, when I thank people for, um, who help with the book, I, I forgot to mention Rosemary uh, Elliott, Michael McCauley and Michael Casey, all of whom are here tonight. I'm grateful for them as well. I have a brief story I should mention, probably in relation to Frank's, that uh, when Frank... Um, one, I think it was the Catholic Media Award for journalism or reporting. Yeah, I got a note from George Pell and he said, he said, oh, that's great about Frank, you're getting the Catholic Media Award. He said, are they going to set up any awards, any, any agnostic awards for you? He said. <laughs> so I said, oh. <laughs> so he had a sense of humour, yeah, he had a sense of humour. Um, if you were direct with him. Um, in relation to, well, I'll be as brief as I can. What happened was that after George Pell was the first to set up any kind of response 
within the Catholic Church to handle clerical child sexual abuse. He did it with the Melbourne response. And that was taken over by Archbishop Hart when Pearl was moved to Sydney. And Archbishop Hart worked with Victoria Police. <clears throat> and there are statements of this effect quoted in the book. There was a common action between the Catholic Archdiocese of Melbourne and Victoria Police to handle this issue. <clears throat> but the, but the, excuse me. <clears throat> but the leadership of the, of the police changed and the attitude to the church changed. And after that, there was a vendetta by leading figures in the Victorian police force, in my view, and I documented in the book that they, they, were, going to, um, they were going to move against the Catholic Church, primarily, in my view, because they wanted to cover their own errors. If the Victoria police had just leave, I'm not talking about sexual abuse in government schools or Anglican schools or anywhere else. I'm just looking at the Catholic Church. There were two notorious pedophiles, clerical pedophiles acting in, Vic, in rural Victoria. They were known to the police. Monsignor Day was one, Gerald Ridsdale was another. They were, it is well established that police were aware of this and covered it up. It's, it's, I've mentioned it in the book. But what happened was that when this became a bigger issue, Victoria Police, in my view, or the new leadership of Victoria Police, didn't want to accept any responsibility for not having acted. I mean, if Ridsdale and Day had been locked up in 1975, the problem would have been very minimal. Most of the offending took place through the late 60s into the early 80s. Day could have been locked up in 71. His case was even covered in the newspapers in Victoria, but the police wouldn't look at it. And then after that, the relationship deteriorated, and I think um, I think Victoria Police wanted wanted to nail someone, and Pearl was the highest figure, and um, the Royal Commission treated Pearl in a very hostile manner. I think that's fair to say. That's documented. You can read it. Um, now their their findings had nothing to do with his conviction. They were totally unrelated, but they were part of a of an environment, um, and I. I think that was the way it was, and then the Victorian legal system turned out to be pretty hospital, hostile. But the brilliant, um, well, I think it's the most devastating dissent in Australian criminal law history of Mark Weinberg in the uh, Court of Appeal, where he went against the Chief Justice and the President of the Court of Appeal, is an absolutely devastating judgment, and uh, that looks at a lot of it, it, a lot of it. But there has been a lot of um, there's been a lot of unprofessional behaviour in Victorian police over a long period. There have been some good times, but there have probably been some more bad times than good times. And I just think, if, I mean, I've read the, the police interview with George Pell, which they did in Rome. He didn't have to give an interview. He gave an interview to Victoria Police, didn't have to do, do it. it they, they handled it incompetently. They made factual errors um, talking to Pell. They didn't know large parts of the area where Pell had operated in Ballarat. They were unaware of that. They sought advice from him about some matters that had been discussed. The interview was an absolute disgrace. And, and even, um, even Lucy morris Mar or Melissa Davey, one of Pell's members of the Pell Parlon, made, made the point that they were surprised how short the interview was, which went only for two and a half hours across six or seven matters because the Victorian police didn't know what they were talking about. They had no idea. Now, I've, re I've read that transcript um, the, the, the transcript, transcript in relation to the cathedral trial was pub published. Others you can get in other ways. but So I just think they were incompetent and the Victorian majority in the Victoria Code of Appeal didn't have to, the courage to take it on. But there was a very clever lawyer and there were others around. So I think that's the basis of it. But if, if you go back and look at it now, when Pell went to Melbourne um, and was made the Archbishop of Melbourne in 1996 and immediately started the Melbourne response, we now know that there was offend and to, to rule out Catholic priests and brothers. We re we now know that there was <coughs> wide scale wide scale sexual abuse engaged in by principals and teachers in government schools in Victoria, which hasn't been examined until 2023. And that says a lot. Thank you for the wonderful talk, uh, Robin Fitzsimons. Um, question to Father Brennan, and I must confess my Protestant provenance. Um, the, it's concerning, I think, that the pile-on, the 
the but if you put this in the context of other uh, recent or relatively recent cases, namely the Chamberlain case, the Catherine Folbig case, both of which were cases which looked at seem to a lay person to lack the relevant proof. Um, if you put that in a theological context, going back, let's say, to Jesus Christ, going back to Shakespeare's Julius Caesar, the human ganging up instinct, how can, we, how can the legal system better protect the ordinary citizen against this human ganging up instinct against people who are prima facie pretty unpopular? Um, I mean, the, the Folbig case ignored the fact that <coughs> in a poly the size, yeah, you know, the that coincidences. I think it's occur. absolutely imperative to insist on the rule of law being applied, and on proper legal representation being provided for people, and for a truly independent media, and for thorns in the side like Jared Henderson, who you know review the media, etc that basically unless we have a citizenry who are committed to truth and to the rule of law, then there will be trouble in cases such as this. And what we saw in this one, I think it was the culmination of something of the tall poppy syndrome and it was also something of the uh, need to find a scapegoat. And uh, Pell was the top of the Catholic tree, he was there in Melbourne, and all of this was being agitated and basically he was the target. Uh, but it is only by rigorous policing, it is only by proper work of the Director of Public Prosecutions, her exercise of discretions in these cases was dreadful. I mean the second incident which was put forward in this case, it was admitted in the court that the Chief Police Investigator knew of no investigation of anybody regarding the second so-called incident, including a man by the name of Egan, who was the priest who was said to be standing beside Pell, who'd left the priesthood, was working in a local council, the police had never spoken to him. Yes, well that's a very good question. To both authors, has there been, are you aware of any other cases where the police virtually advertise for a complainant or they would call a victim. <laughs> I'm not aware. No. Well, the police effectively on, I think it was Christmas Eve, um, um, effectively advertised on the front page of the Melbourne Herald Sun and uh, The Age by breaking a story, calling for victims, alleged victims to come forward who were in the choir in the cathedral in dates which exactly match uh, Cardinal Pell's presence or Archbishop Pell's presence in Victoria. I've never heard of that before. The interesting thing was they got nobody. nobody uh, they thought they would, but no one came forward. No one no one did. So then they went off on another tangent. But uh, you know, so it was a kind of an advertisement that no one took up. Thank you. How much do you think uh, all this uh, tragedy uh, was down to anti-Christianity on top of everything else? To me, there was a strong anti-religious, anti-Christianity focus. Well, I think that's, I think there's an element of that. Um, it's interesting. If you just look, I mean, the main focus has been on the Catholic Church, of course. But if you look at Tasmania, where this inquiry is going on at the moment, or just two inquiries have just finished, the Royal Commission, headed by Peter McClellan, only looked at two institutions in the whole of Tasmania. One was the Christian School, Hutchins School, and one was the Ch Church of England Boys Society. They didn't look at one government school, so there were two Christian schools. And if you look at through all of them, I mean, the inquiries are essentially into. A Catholic and Anglican and other Christian schools, and there are some some exceptions, but that's where the focus was, and there was no reason for the focus to be there. All those matters had to be considered, of course, but there was no reason why others' matters shouldn't have been considered as well. But in Victoria, of course, um, there were other other political factors prevailing, I guess, uh, within Victoria Police, which has got 
a very uneven record. I mean, you look at the Lawyer X case in Victoria, you look at some of the recent, recent cases in Victoria and they're, they're quite shocking. Um, but the Victorian government um, will not set up an inquiry into the Pell case. I th don't think Victoria wants to know much about it anymore. Whether the coalition would ever get back into government, I don't know. It hasn't said it would, so I don't know. Uh, what, what does the media coverage tell us about the state of media in this country? <laughs> well, I think it tells you this, and I'm, I'm currently in an argument with the ABC, but you'd be surprised about this. I'm in an argument with the ABC. <laughs> Because the ABC ran all this Annie Pell stuff. I mean, you know these names. Sarah Ferguson did a program which is absolutely shocking and, and, and full of completely false accusations. Uh, Louise Milligan did a, a several. Uh, Paul Kennedy did a program. Susan Smith, when she was on the ABC, did a lot. David Ma, when he was on the ABC, did a lot. And it was just littered with it. And then after the, uh, after the High Court decision, um, up, up comes first Frank Brennan, and uh, Keith Winchell did a book. He got one interview on the ABC and then there was strong opposition to that interview taking place from journalist and uh, management, as I understand it. And then his book came out first and then Frank's book came out and then my book came out. And in spite of the fact that the ABC has got two tel television channels, 60 radio channels, online outlets, an online magazine, um, neither Frank nor myself have been able to score one interview and the ABC say, well, it's because it's not really important. And the Australian last a, a week or so ago ran Michael Kirby's comment, or two comments, and made it ran a comment by Archbishop Fisher here criticising the Victorian legal system, focus on Victoria Police. I would have thought if the Catholic Archbishop of Sydney criticises Victoria Police, that's probably news. Um, the ABC wouldn't cover it. And the same story by Dennis Shanahan on the front page of The Australian mentioned Michael Kirby's comments that have been quoted here tonight. And the ABC has advised me that not, neither of these matters are of news. Uh, so that's the environment in which we live. Now, uh, the nine newspapers aren't much better. The Guardian isn't much better. The Saturday paper, the New Daily, and on you go. But that's the world in which we, uh, in which we live, so... But it keeps me going, I must say. <laughs> the last time I spoke to the manager of the ABC, David Anderson, was a few years ago. I said, well, I want you to reform the place, but don't do it in a hurry because I need something to write about. You know, I'm sure you feel the same. We're coming up to um, the last few minutes. So I, we've got we, – we do have uh, time for, for one brief last question. And if we don't have that, perhaps we could have a bit of a roundup from Father Brennan and from from Jared about where the Cardinal Pell case now leaves the Catholic Church. Is it is it very wounded? How does it recover? Well, Craig, uh, I think undoubtedly the church has been very wounded by it. Uh, I mean, the whole sexual abuse crisis, of course, has been very wounding for the church, and understandably and. Properly so, but particularly where there was such a focus on someone who was, if you like, the emblem of the Catholic Church in the public square, then I think that has done enormous harm. Uh, I think the other aspect I'd raise about that Jared touched on, but you've got to remember the way Pell used to operate. Like when he was made Archbishop of Melbourne, there's no doubt that Kennett as Premier and McGarvey as Governor said, you've got to do something about this and clean it up. Now, George was always one for the top end of town and it didn't matter what it cost. And so he went to the top lawyers and he set up a scheme and he did it in close consultation every step of the way with the Victorian Solicitor General and the Victorian Police Commissioner. And they signed off on everything and they set up a scheme which emulated the criminal compensation scheme. Now, sure, paid much less than what we now have. But back then in the 90s, every step of the way, he did in cooperation with the Solicitor General and with Victoria Police. And from there, you had a situation where later there were developments. But, of course, 2001, he became the Archbishop of Sydney. 
and so the caravan moved on. So by 2012, you then had a situation developing with a new load of police in Victoria, including Mr Ashton, who said, we don't want to do these deals with the Catholic Church anymore. Fine. But then there was the Victorian Parliamentary Committee, where, as the Victorian Parliamentary Committee unanimously said, Victoria police unfairly distanced themselves from the arrangements that had been put in place. The other thing to emphasise is this. What Pell set up, when I say he went to the top end of town, I mean, the lawyers he put on those panels included people like Susan Crennan, who later went on to the High Court, Alex Chernoff, who later went on to the Supreme Court and became the Governor, Habsburger, who later became a Supreme Court judge. And in fact, most of the ones from the top end of town were not Catholic, and that was deliberately so. So he was definitely about saying, this has to be cleaned up according to the principles and standards of the day. The principles and standards of the day changed over the next 10 or 20 years, and he then, to some extent, became a victim of that. And that, too, has contributed to a sense that the Catholic Church was not wanting to do the right thing. Whereas I think, no matter what differences I was having with Pearl back in those days, he was wanting to do the right thing, but significantly he went, as he often did, and as you know from his 1971 thesis, he went alone. So the other bishops were setting up what was called Towards Healing. He said, I'm not going to have any of that, you know, all sorts of bishops, committees, etc. I'm going to have something which is Melbourne-based, where the Solicitor General has signed off, the Police Commissioner has signed off, and the payments are in accordance with criminal compensation principles. Thanks, Rick. I think that's an excellent summary. I don't want to add much to it. Uh, I don't want to add anything to it, but I, I do think on a more general uh, s scheme, what we have here is very much a manifestation of the hostility to not religious belief, but Christian religious belief. And that's been around for a while. I think it's stronger in Victoria probably than it is in other parts of Australia, but I think that was a broader, a broader operation. But Pell was the leading Catholic figure. He wasn't the head of the Catholic Church in Australia, but he was the leading figure of the Catholic Church. But because of that, he was also the leading uh, Christian identity. Um, and he was a conservative Christian. And um, that didn't help him. But, uh, but he ended up happy with Frank, so... <laughs> He ended up uniting with neo-Protestant Catholics. That's what he did. And hopefully enjoying eternal bliss. <laughs> now, um, that sweet hum of the vacuum cleaner in the background uh, reminds me that we are at the top of our hour and we need to wrap up. So I do want to thank Jared for doing the, all that work uh, in, in uh, revising or adding to his, his book and to Father Brennan for joining us tonight. And, and really giving us a, gr a great insight into what it was like behind the scenes uh, during that incredible time. So thank you both. Thank you.